Anyone who's involved uh, with co-design, co-creation, any of these movements that try very hard to ensure that the line between creator and community is one that we're always interrogating and blurring, understands that this is a difficult set of questions and challenges, and that it puts us into um, questions where we have to ask questions about our, our ethical stances, the frameworks we use to explore them. So we have a marvelous panel of people who have been creating with communities uh, in all sorts of different media and who are incredibly thoughtful about these sorts of ethical issues. And so what we're gonna do is give everybody a little bit of a chance to talk about their work, then engage uh, the five of us in a bit of a conversation about some of these issues and then open up to a conversation here in this room, which I am gonna assume is gonna spread out as we hang out together uh, with each other this evening. Um, so I'll introduce folks as, as they come and speak a little bit, and I'm gonna start with uh, Yasmin Alayat, who's the co-creator of 18 Days in Egypt, a really remarkable interactive documentary about the Egyptian Revolution. Uh, and she's gone on to direct the Emmy-nominated Zero Days, which is a VR documentary about cyber warfare, the Stuxnet virus, um, she's also co-founder at Scatter, which is an in immersive uh, entertainment and software company uh, that's working on, on producing uh, some really fascinating new works in this space. So, welcome. Thank you. Um, so I am, excuse me, I'll be using my notes, uh, just in case. Uh, just a second. Oh, okay, I may have gone too wait, far. Wait, wait, wait. Oh. Okay. <laughs> there we go. All right, this is me, all right. Um, so, uh, as Ethan mentioned, uh, um, well, some of the projects I'm going to be talking about today, but um, just as a, uh, for the panels, uh, for the discussion, I thought it'd be helpful to show some examples of what co-creation means to me in some projects I've been working on um, before Scatter and at Scatter. And one thing I want to mention before jumping in, this idea of like a director and an audience is like these roles or something I see is like non-existent. Um, for me, they've been blurred for a long time where I see myself as not a director, but more of a, a designer and an influencer, and my audience as my co-creators, and uh, hopefully it should come through in the work. Um, so, on, oops, one more. Okay, this is, I don't know why it's jumping. Can we get, no, we're in the, the wrong slide deck. We, uh, no, that's not the right deck. Yep, that's me. <laughs> All right, I'll keep talking. All right, so uh, the project you'll see uh, is, uh, I'll, I'll just start introducing it. So as um, we, so 18 Days in Egypt um, is a web native documentary that calls on uh, the community to tell the story of the ongoing Egyptian revolution uh, using their own media and, um, and using their own voice. And it's the, it started with um, obviously the, the events in 2011 when we saw Egyptians were essentially documenting a revolution in real time. And they were doing so using photos and videos off cell phones and cameras and also using social media as Facebook and Twitter. And so my partner, Jagger Mate and I, we were so inspired by this and we're like, how can we capture a moment like this um, and how can we create a platform that would essentially empower a community to tell this story using their, you know, from their own perspectives on the ground in real time and how can we essentially create something that is uh, like having a country write their own history. And so that's what, um, so we created 18daysinegypt.com and it's a... Uh, a living document and uh, where anyone at the time um, could upload their, their stories collaboratively or individually and just tell what it means like to live through a historical moment like this that it goes beyond the headlines that you normally see in the news. It's about the human experience and so we collected you know thousands of stories and stuff that uh, varies from uh, stories of obviously loss and and uh, you know uh, conflict to bitterness and uh, a sense of new hope to uh, love. Um, so hopefully, uh, so right now uh, this project, as we said, it's like an ongoing. We have a counter revolution and things have shifted and maybe we can talk about that later later during the panel. It's out of scope for for now. 
Um, so I'm going to jump quickly to Scatter and the, how we think about collaborative uh, and co-creation uh, today. And Scatter, uh, our mission is to define this language of what we're calling volume, volumetric filmmaking. And volumetric filmmaking for us is the marriage between gaming and film. We uh, leverage the power and flexibility of game engines with the um, craft and sensibility of filmmaking. Um, so the, the idea is to capture real people and real stories and real places um, inside of 3D worlds we construct. And what that enables is essentially you have these immersive room scale environments where you can walk around through the space with the people who are telling these stories or experience the stories where these uh, in the actual you know, environments. And uh, so at Scatter, we are doing two things. Like one is, as I was mentioning, we're making these films and projects, but we're building a tool that we're trying to, um, oh, okay, uh, I have one minute. <laughs> She's got a little bit longer, we've had a time. Okay. Um, so we're trying to build these tools that leverage the workflows of, um, for filmmakers to translate what you already know as creators into this volumetric uh, space. Uh, so I'm going to jump ahead a little bit then and maybe talk about uh, a few projects. So one project I wanted to mention um, is Blackout. And Blackout is a documentary made uh, in response to the Trump's election, um, to the polarizing climate, you know, the Muslim ban, rescinding DACA. And we wanted to see, well, what does it feel, what does it mean to be American and uh, how do people think about identity and otherness right now in this kind of climate. Uh, and we wanted real people, real New Yorkers, you know, people we see every day in the, in the subway, uh, we wanted to see through their lens. And through it. so what we did is we um, created this, uh, our version of a crowdsourced documentary where we captured, um, it's another living document, where we captured a bunch of different um, New Yorkers with, from very different perspectives and they, you know, different backgrounds and beliefs uh, that clash with each other actually. And uh, we, every, anytime you enter this train, you'll meet a different set of people. You never, no one experience is the same. And you can walk around and sit with these different experiences and you hear the thoughts and the stories of the people around you on the train. And hopefully in the space in between their different ideas and thoughts, um, you can kind of uh, connect your own dots and um, have an experience. Um, so you yeah. let, me, let me ask a question because yeah. um, 18 days in Egypt, I think for many people, was um, a really sort of paradigmatic example of a new form of documentary making, where it was possible to interact with um, huge amounts of sort of raw material uploaded by different people. It felt um, like a deeply democratized form of filmmaking. Um, Volumetric filmmaking feels really hard for most people to have the ability to sort of directly participate in and, and have a hand in. How are you dealing with that tension within your, your own work, going from um, sort of really lowering barriers to entry, letting people directly upload footage, to now um, you know, being involved with it, this quite technically difficult process, but looking for some of the same goals? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. I would say that uh, there's kind of a balancing act we're doing at Scatter. So uh, part of the tension with uh, in inaccessibility is from a content access perspective, but also to make this work, it's not, it's hard, you need a team, you need to know how to plumb code, or, you know, it's not the easiest. Um, it's also can be expensive. Um, and so uh, I would say from a, uh, the, the way, uh, as a, as a, as a, group of artists that all come from a similar background, uh, my partners and I, uh, the way we're trying to mitigate that is the tools we're building are literally, um, um, are meant to be, are meant to tackle this issue. It's supposed to be accessible. Um, it's meant to be a, a way to democratize this. And it's like leveraging workflows people should know already. You don't have to learn the language of 3D and use it to translate into this space. Um, Brownsville was made and shot using DefKit, and we're very proud of that project. We love you guys. And uh, uh, we're hoping that more and more, more creators can access these tools and this language is not something that you have to, to oh, learn. That's awesome and, and, and a beautiful goal with that as well. Let's uh, let's head over to Grace Legis for a moment if we can, if we can pass over the, the clicker as well as uh, 
the microphone. Uh, Grace Lee is an independent writer, director, and producer. Um, she's a Peabody winner for American Revolutionary, The Evolution of Grace Lee Boggs. Um, she's the director and producer of a whole lot of films, many of them documentaries, uh, some of them fiction, some of them fictional documentaries. I was really hoping she was going to talk about the early work American Zombie because it raises some really interesting questions. What is community involvement and informed consent amongst the undead? Uh, but instead, uh, she's going to talk about a recent work, uh, K-Town 92, and also about uh, some of the creative communities involved with it. Thank you. Um, and first, thanks everyone for having me here. Uh, like Ethan said, I'm a pretty traditional documentary filmmaker. I also make fiction. Um, but thanks to people like Kamal Sinclair, I've been really sort of delving into other kinds of worlds with interactive stuff. I had an opportunity to participate in a world building residency at USC last fall. Um, and, you know, Kat, I'm one of the people that she interviewed who said, oh, I've never used the word co-creation before, but it seems really familiar. Um, so I'm going to talk about K-Town 92, um, which is a project I made last year. Um, Ford Foundation was one of the funders, thank you. Um, this is a web-based interactive um, documentary that looks at the 1992 Los Angeles civil unrest, or the riots, uprising, however you want to call it, from a diverse perspective of Angelinos who lived through it. Um, it's kind of a community-based storytelling project that's also what I like to call like a deconstructed documentary um, that you know sort of came about to sort of answer all of the kind of questions that were coming up um, around the 25th anniversary of that event. Um, so just a little bit of background, how did it come about? Um, I was already developing a long-term documentary about Koreatown, uh, wow. which is the neighborhood oops, in which I live. Uh, for those of you not familiar with it, it's a neighborhood right in the middle of central Los Angeles. It's a really dense urban neighborhood. It's about four square miles with about 100,000 people living in it. Uh, it's called Koreatown, but actually most of the residents are Latino. Uh, there's also a Bangladeshi community. There's also like a Islamic center of Southern California there. So Koreatown, you know, even calling it Koreatown, we're sort of disrupting what Koreatown actually is. Um, and there are a couple different issues coming up um, with, uh, well, let's, maybe we'll just take a look at it. If you go to K-Town 92, I'll just play it for a while. I'll just, um, actually there's an intro video, but maybe we should just go to the hamburger up top and go to, um, Skip intro, yeah. So what happens is um, there's different buckets of footage um, that populate this website, um, drawing from archival images from community archives, drawing from interviews that I did in 2017 or other filmmakers did, um, news footage from 1992, and also B-roll from both 1992 and 2017, and everything sort of exists in one place, and you can move around the screens and, you know, listen to different pieces and stories. Um, hold on, sorry. This is all just archival, but if you go to next, maybe we'll see like an interview pop up. Um, okay, we're stuck in an archival loop, I guess. Uh, but anyway, the idea is, um, you know, it sort of came about because, well, here's an example. Um, it came about because, uh, the, as I was already making this Koreatown documentary, um, the, or thinking about this Koreatown documentary, there was, every five years in Los Angeles, there's like big media hoopla every time there's an anniversary of, of this event. And it always brings out sort of, um, kind of rehashing narrative tropes about like the angry black protesters or the, you know, the Latino looters or the Korean immigrants who are hysterical because their businesses have burned down or they're, you know, on the rooftops of their storefronts with guns. And these are the same images that keep, you know, recycling over 25 years and living in this neighborhood and hearing different kinds of stories. I wanted to, you know, find a different way to tell this story. And so that's how k 92 came about. Um, one minute. Oh, my God. Okay. Um, so... Should I sum it up? <laughs> well, you can look at this on, on your, at, at, you know, at a different time, but um, the idea was to um, create an intervention in all of the media that was being um, distributed around the anniversary by making this project and then putting it out on the internet and also allowing it to sort of continue and grow. Um, if you click on the CC there, um, down on the bottom, 
you know, a lot of different things came as after releasing the project with different communities. Um, the idea to put everything, all the interviews um, that I did in 2017 with English and Korean and Spanish subtitles was something that was also kind of co-created <coughs> with different communities. Um, and also, you know, working with different community groups to find the people who would be interviewed or participate in the project um, was one of those, one of the processes. Um, and I should also mention that Visual Communications is an Asian American media archive that's been around for the past 50 years. And a lot of the community-based archive came out of their, you know, um, library, which had just been sitting around for 25 years, not really being used. So it was another way to address the problem that I often think about as a documentary filmmaker is all this footage that we shoot and there's so much of it's just left on drives or on tapes and it's never getting used. So bringing that back to light was one of the, one of the um, perks, I guess, of doing this project. What, what was it like in talking to people who'd lived through these experiences 25 years ago, looking at some of this footage, which really in many ways, just sort of looking at it on the screen, reminds us of these sometimes really old and tired tropes of ways in which uh, a number of populations are misrepresented and ways in which the TV news camera eye was clearly looking for a particular set of imagery. You're now really subverting that and sort of adding some context to it years later. What was it like sort of bringing that imagery and that set of tropes to, to people who are sort of reconsidering this 25 years after the fact? Well, I wasn't really bringing it to them because they already had it in their minds, but what I think, um, and everyone who participated really wanted to participate because they're like, oh, you're, I, I want to tell my own story of how I saw this. One um, example that always comes to mind is, uh, you know, we all, if, if we were around or if we watched all the films of, you know, there's this helicopter footage of Reginald Denny, who's the white trucker that got pulled from a truck and got beaten up. Um, so there's that story that we've always seen in documentaries and things, but in, in K-Town 92, there's a woman named Anita Wells, who was um, a middle school student from South LA and African American, and she talks about how she was actually on a bus, you know, she was being bused to Westwood, but she was on a bus stuck at the corner of Florence and Normandy when that was happening, and her perspective telling that story was through the bus, like, window, and so that's a really different perspective from the helicopter aerial footage that we've all seen. So, you know, that's one of the goals, to just reshift, you know, the perspective of how we view these events. Thanks for that. I, I, I want to come back as we go a little bit further and sort of talk more about how you found the community and how you identified it. But I'm hoping you might just be able to pass the mic and the clicker over to Amelia. Um, Amelia Winger Bearskin is a, a Native American artist and activist and educator. Um, she's a member of uh, the Iroquois Nation, the Seneca Cayuga people. Um, she's a recent MacArthur winner. Congratulations for her uh, immersive uh, 360 video series uh, about Native American mythologies. And she's also director of product at Decoded, which is an educational technology company. Uh, and looking forward to hearing a bit more about your work. Thank you so much. And thank you, Kat, for inviting me and for Kamal for inviting me into this community. <laughs> um, um, my name is Amelia Winger Bearskin, and as you mentioned, I'm Iroquois Seneca Cayuga Nation. Um, we call ourselves the Haudenosaunee, which means the people of the Longhouse, um, but the name that was given to us and is most recognizable is the Iroquois Nation. We're six nations, and I'm two of the six. Um, I'm a native New Yorker. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is the piece that was generously uh, supported by the MacArthur Foundation Sundance Institute called Monsters. Um, I, I co-created this project with my best friend and artist, Wendy Redstar, and it's called Monsters, Keepers of the Land. It's one of two uh, episodes of an immersive um, installation and VR piece about um, our respective culture's monsters. So the first episode is about her monsters, and the second is about mine, and we're doing them both together. Um, the first time that I ever s performed, I'm a performance artist and interactive media artist and VR director, uh, the first time I ever performed in front of an audience was with my mother at eight. Uh, she's an Iroquois storyteller and I would play the rattles and the drum and I would sing and she would tell stories. Um, a storyteller in our culture is not like a performer in a Western sense. It's like part politician, <laughs> part historian, uh, part uh, prayer, and maybe part um, creation or craft. 
um, because we embed our stories into multiple medias. Their songs, their story that is in the rattle, the sound that the rattle makes helps tell certain parts of stories. Um, there's different parts of time when you will tell a story, like during strawberry season or in the winter. Um, and so you need to, throughout your entire life, first be identified and given this role within the community and then travel um, sometimes all over the world in order to gather pieces of this history in order to form your own version of this story that then you co-perform with your audience. So I would look at my audience and decide what story I would like to manifest from these facts that I understand and I might ask you something about yourself and he would become part of this story. And so. Um, thinking of it as a singular performance from one person would be a, a, quite a misunderstanding. So I'm glad you're here today to help me uh, share this with you. Um, I've thought of this research framework because I'm someone who has an AI background, computer science background, as a decentralized storytelling. Um, so I'm kind of using new terminology to talk about something that's very old. Um, I wanted to show you a good example, which is wampum. So wampum is something that um, from my uh, culture we have and a lot of people uh, who came and first discovered us uh, misunderstood what wampum was and said that it was currency. Uh, and so they decided to make their own bootleg version and then they were like, yes, and it didn't work. And they were like, how come we like made these fake wampum? Now wampum is a shell that you kind of carve into a bead. And they're like, how come we have these gallons and gallons and buckets and buckets of wampum and we can't buy what other people with that same wampum can buy? And that's because wampum is actually a lot more like modern day blockchain or Bitcoin than it is like, <laughs> like money, right? So, and the reason why is because it's a visual a physical and spiritual manifestation of a contract that happened in a place and time that was negotiated through storytelling. So you and I might have tell our stories of where we came from, and then we would tell the story of where we wanted to go, and someone would be weaving this belt. And this is actually our most famous wampum, which is our great law of peace of the Iroquois Confederacy. And Thomas Jefferson lived with our people in upstate New York in Agonandigan, our largest city, for a year and a half and he modeled the American Confederate, you know, our Constitution, um, after this document. Um, and he got it pretty clearly similar, except for the fact that we say that only women can vote. And he said the same thing, I think, right? Yeah, the same thing. Um, pretty much, right? Um, <laughs> It yeah. might have been slightly lost in translation. Maybe, yeah, a little bit. As well as Iroquois women, you know, I don't know. Um, anyway, so it's interesting to kind of think about how uh, stories need to be embedded in all these different forms. They need to be currency, they need to be multimedia, they need to be time-based, they need to mirror the, our lived experience closer, so it means they're really long, like sometimes it takes us hours, days, months, years to tell a story. Um, maybe it's episodic. And so I want to talk about some modern ways in which we're decentralized storytelling. Um, Minecraft, like my son is obsessed with it. Some of you here may be obsessed with it or have children who are, where, where people are every day building a, a shared reality and they're co-creating a world of decentralized storytelling and it has currency and it has um, stories and it's bedded in different media. Um, another thing that maybe isn't as positive of a concept but it's still <laughs> an example of sort of this shared decentralized storytelling are conspiracies, things like flat earth conspiracy. <laughs> Right there. So, you know, where it's it's multi different medias, it's different forums, it has a lot of it has its own currency and, and in person gatherings, and then other things um, like modern day blockchain and, and Bitcoin. Um, and this is just a, a, a quote from something that I, I wrote for Immerse, and thank you so much for, for helping me with that piece, Jessica, and um, for everyone at, at the MacArthur Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and at MIT, and thank you, Kat, so much for having me here. Thank you. So, that, that, uh, just wonderful and beautiful ideas in there, and I'm really struck in particular about this idea that um, distributed storytelling is something that, that really goes on in real time, whether we think about it or not, whether it's people trying to give themselves a story about QAnon or the Flat Earth, or in some ways the, the, the reality that we are collectively and sort of consensually um, creating by not believing those conspiracies and believing something else altogether. Um, one of the things that um, that you seem to be sort of suggesting is is a time and a place and a context for these stories and these storytelling. Um, how do you think about that when we start moving into the space of 
the web, the internet, interconnectivity of a lot of people who are not necessarily seeing each other, interacting with one another, but telling each other stories, sometimes which can be very constructive, some of which are very destructive. Well, uh, the Iroquois have this concept of seven generations, and I know a lot of people are like, very familiar with that. Like Anything you do now will have implications in seven generations, but I also like to think of it that anything I'm doing now, I am in collaboration and co-creation with seven generations before myself. Another way to think about it is if I want to teach something, I have to make sure that it has to last for seven generations. And the way we have this technology in our culture that shows us how we can do that. For instance, we still know our language and we still know about wampum and we still know about our stories and our crafts. And the reason for that is we embed these uh, truths that we teach through storytelling that's distributed across media. Mm -hmm. So in order to reinforce this concept, we have this, this structure of decentralized storytelling so that it will last. And so that's, you know, the, I love the title of this panel because it's about like the dangers as well. And so that's yeah. why I wanted to put that up there that when you distribute information, you make it stronger and it will last. Good or bad. <laughs> Good or bad. Well, and in particular, the notion of storytelling across a lot of media takes us directly to Sasha Costanza Chalk's work. Um, so Professor Costanza Chalk is uh, Associate Professor of Civic Media here at MIT. Um, Sasha is also the, the founder of the co-design studio uh, here at MIT. Uh, author of uh, Out of the Shadows into the Streets, Transmedia Organizing and the Immigrant and Immigrants' Rights. Um, Sasha is also a board member of the Allied Media Project, which runs the, the really remarkable annual uh, Allied Media Conference. And uh, they're the person who's really, uh, I think, probably taught me the most at MIT about frameworks and methods uh, to think about co-design and think about involving uh, the communities that we're trying to work with deeply in the work that we're trying to do. So, Sasha. Thanks, Ethan. And it's a, a pleasure and an honor to be here um, on this panel with all of you and in this room with such brilliance. Um, I, in my previous life, before I was a professor at MIT, um, I worked a lot on collaborative production of documentary films with the Indie Media Network and the global justice movement. Um, but I think what I wanted to, to show first, we don't really, five minutes is not a lot of time, so I'm just going to mention a couple projects and some websites that you can look at uh, more so that we can get into the conversation. But I did want to begin by showing um, a short clip um, about uh, the media-based organizing framework that uh, Ill and Paige um, and Wes um, from DNA talked about earlier. So let's show that clip. Media-based organizing is any collaborative process it's not that showing on the screen. media to address the roots of problems. <laughs> Rewind the record, please. <laughs> Organizing is any collaborative process that uses media to address the roots of problems and advances holistic solutions towards a more just and creative world. When we say media, we mean all the ways we communicate with one another and the world. When we say organizing, we mean the ways we come together to transform the problems that we face. Throwing parties that let us heal. Creating alternatives to police by keeping each other safe. Using theater to explore social issues is all organizing. Mainstream media has a long history of misrepresenting and harming many of our communities. We need media that honors the humanity, dignity, and brilliance of our communities. Media-based organizing changes our relationship to media. We transform from consumers to producers. When we make our own media, we build the creative skills we need to shape our own realities. Over the past 18 years, the Allied Media Conference has developed the vision and practice of media-based organizing. Deep listening. Listening with a willingness to be changed by what you hear. Honoring complexity. 
weaving together different and sometimes divergent perspectives. Iteration. Do something. Evaluate and reflect. Adapt to change and do it better. Facilitated leadership. Leadership whose purpose is to grow the leadership and vision of others through the process of collaboratively creating media. Media is all the ways we communicate. Organizing is all the ways we come together to transform the problems that we face. Allied Media Project's broad network of media-based organizers are sharing the tools, skills, and stories that allow us to create, connect, and transform ourselves and our world. So I wanted to share that um, because this is the framework that's been very, very influential uh, to me and to my work and to my own evolution, both in the practice that I do uh, as a media producer and someone who's involved in media projects, as well as in uh, the theory and writing that I do about uh, the relationship between media and organizing and activism. And I'll just end by, I'm just gonna show a couple slides for some projects that are built uh, coming out of that framework and then, um, and then I'm sure Ethan has a tough question for me. So can you bring, can you bring the slides back? Um, thanks. Yeah. So, uh, for example, um, one project which was produced by um, a whole bunch of organizations uh, together, um, each of which works at the intersection of LGBTQ uh, and or two-spirit identity and other identities that are marginalized under white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, capitalism, settler colonialism, and ableism is the Transformative Media Organizing Project which you can learn more about at transformativemedia.cc. Um, this was a two-year um, research and Skillshare project um, where we um, researched basically what do queer organizations uh, say is working for them when it comes to using media in their organizing work. Um, this is a more recent project uh, called More Than Code, um, which is another um, participatory research project um, conducted with um, a whole bunch of organizations around the U.S. Uh, we interviewed 109 technology practitioners and conducted 11 focus groups around the country with another um, 80 or so people um, who are using technology for social change, for the public interest, for social justice. And again, talk to them about how did they get into that work, um, what are the barriers, how do we build that field uh, in a way that's going to really make sense. And um, you can learn more about that at morethancode.cc. And then the last slide that I have is just about the co-design studio, um, which I then mentioned, which is, this is a space within MIT where I work with students and community-based organizations, and we do uh, collaborative design of media projects um, using a, a media organizing framework uh, together. And you can learn more about that at codesign.mit.edu. Thanks. So, Sasha, you and I are both embedded within an institution that has a lot of values around engineering and problem solving and the creation of new technologies through rapid iteration to solve sometimes ineptly defined problems. <laughs> What's the difference between the methods that you're using in something like co-design and the ways in which um, engineering often goes after solving these problems? That is such a great question, and it gives me an opportunity to put up my last slide, which I forgot about. <laughs> <laughs> Could you bring the slide back, please? <laughs> um. that, that was not a setup, although you know, it, it's nice when you've known someone for a long time, you occasionally can pull off stuff like that. Oh, there it is. So, because we got so frustrated, and when I say we, I mean the communities that I work in, the practitioners that I uh, feel kinship with, um, and the network that I'm part of through Allied Media Conference, we got so frustrated at the fuzzy floating of concepts about uh, collaboration and participation and the way that that can too often be used as an extractive method uh, to gather ideas from a community, take them away, uh, turn them into a product, and sell them back that a bunch of us starting about three years ago started to say we need to get really explicit and specific about how we think about using design to challenge uh, intersectional oppression 
um, and the Matrix of Domination, CF of Patricia Hill Collins, Black Feminist Thought, and we came up with Design Justice. And so there's now a Design Justice Network um, that is trying to um, develop a theory and practice around what it means to um, um, to not not allow that uh, fuzziness, to specify what is the system of oppression that we're trying to transform, overcome, and change, um, and how do we work together to design things in a way that will advance collective liberation and ecological sustainability, rather than just saying, well, it's nice to have some touch points with the community at some point in the process. So I, I, wanna, I wanna actually look at this question of extraction. And so without putting a, a finger on anyone, um, we can all imagine ways of making work in which our interaction with the community is to essentially extract something from it and use it as the way to push forward our own directorial editorial vision. And we can also imagine ways of creation where we're ceding a great deal of this power and trying to figure out how to co-create. But there's an argument that we have people on stage who are remarkably creative visionaries. And, and I don't want ego and agency to sort of disappear from the picture and our, and our own sort of ego and agency as creators. How do, I, I'd love for each of you to sort of talk about what's that balance between helping a community speak, letting a community choose what to speak about, <coughs> and also the tensions as a filmmaker, as a creator, um, in creating a work of art. And, and Grace, I'm wondering if I, can, if I can go to you first on this one. Yeah, there's tension. <laughs> um, I think, Good, we wouldn't have a panel yeah, otherwise. I, I mean, I think it's interesting because actually to even jump, like think of doing something like K-Town 92 was a completely just sort of abandoning what I knew about not abandoning completely, but taking what I had learned or appreciated about sort of documentary filmmaking practices, but putting it in a completely different way. Like, like there's no, I remember when um, collaborating with the, the programmers, you know, who we found them because they were, you know, recommended, they were all like toddlers during the 1992 <laughs> um, events. But it was really a fascinating process to talk to them about it because, um, you know, it, it, the whole process was just like, it, for me, it was really liberating because, um, you know, having made, pr prior to this, I had just made a few just regular document, like for hire kind of documentaries, same kind of structure. I was really kind of tired of it, you know, and I was looking for something new. And, and the whole idea behind K-1092 was to disrupt, like, how do we tell this story and who gets to tell this story? And so, you know, it sort of Im is embodied in the way that, you know, it, there's, it's very random, like what videos come up. Um, you know, the, the user is given the choice to stay on a video or skip to the next one or decide to silence somebody or not, you know. So that, for me, you know, it's like baby steps. Like I'm not nearly where these guys are, but I, I just felt like for me it was like part of my own evolution, like exploring this world and, and sort of seeding control as the director. What, was there something about the story that required um, yes. a, a different medium. Yeah, I mean, even thinking about making a film about Koreatown, it's such an unwieldy idea because there's so many different ways you could go and I've been struggling with that myself. Like, there's no way I can just choose like this path. It just feels like nothing will be satisfying. And so to sort of hang back and realize, oh, you know, it, it almost just happened out of, um, it was almost a, not an, an accident, but as I was struggling with that other idea, and I realized this anniversary was coming along and all these other big documentaries were being made by National Geographic or Showtime or ABC and realizing those films are gonna take the same sort of tack that I don't wanna take and how can I do something differently? It was more like a, a kind of creative challenge to try it a different way and also sort of wipe out like, there's no one perspective that's going to be the perspective. Right, and, it, and in many ways that it, it feels for me like a lot of resonance with uh, 18 Days in Egypt. Yasmin, was that your first documentary? 
Um, it was my first documentary project. I was coming from, uh, uh, I'm also a computer scientist that uh, worked in, uh, went to art school and worked in the new media space and it was a, my collaboration with Jigger who comes from a video journalism background. And um, as a first documentary, I think what's actually kind of beautiful about this process of, of the tension you're talking about, uh, for this project it was, it's obviously a huge tension when you have uh, to people who are creating a documentary and saying we're removing ourselves completely from the filmmaking process and we're owning that and we're gonna, it's almost like we treated the project as another co-creator because it was the demands of the project which is if your vision really is to create a complete space for a community and teach them a new behavior and hopefully let them shape it, then you really need to commit to that. And for me it was like, I, I don't actually necessarily see that as a tension, it was part of the goals and the mission. Um, so if I can flip it as like it's not attention, yeah. that was the goal. Um, it, it's yeah. it, when when you look at that work, um, and, and when you look at it, say compared to some of the work, like the work on Stuxnet, do do you feel a different sort of authorial relationship? Do you feel like um, you end up sort of interacting with this in a very different way when you're sort of creating this open documentary versus versus a very different sort of documentary? Yeah, it's, uh, what's interesting is that, so Zero Days is, a, for someone who comes from a very participatory interactive background, it's actually a pretty non-interactive uh, documentary and it's pretty linear. And that was the most difficult process for me as someone who thinks in, as frameworks and systems and how do you create these worlds for people. Uh, it was actually very hard to decide to tell the story in one way and this is the way I'm gonna tell it. And uh, that process for me, for, maybe for this room, that you'd, you'd find that funny, but for me that was a difficult process to undertake. It, uh, Amelia, you threw out this sort of amazing challenge, which was to think about seven generations going forward as we're making work and putting it out in the world. And I, I have to confess that um, I, I could imagine that for me just being complete paralysis and, and sort of wondering um, how, how to sort of think within that context. How are you wrestling with these questions of your own authorship the ways in which the traditions, the ideas, the knowledge that you're sharing is you know, interwoven within the fabric of this community that, that you're coming out from and, and, and also representing. How, what's that tension like for you? Well, I think it, it would be overwhelming if I imagined that I had appeared on this planet like alone. <laughs> but I am the product of generations before me and I will continue on this conversation to come. Um, this past year I was really lucky to have as my closest collaborator a man who was in his mid-70s and had been a, a city planner for about ooh, 35 years in the city of New York. And we worked together to create an, a virtual reality and augmented reality app with uh, Mayor Noam Bramson of New Rochelle, New York um, to help citizens co-design and co-create their city. And I'm gonna give a shout out to Nitsan Bartov, who's right there. And she's our lead developer and designer on that both of those apps, so I just wanted to say hello. This is how it natives are. We shout out everyone all the time. Sorry, guys. We just do that. Um, but working with him, he thinks constantly in these 20-year, 35-year, 50-year, 100 year cycles because that's how you have to think if you're a city planner and I felt that really like that resonated with me because that's how I was raised and that's how I think and so I think that's that having people outside of, of um, media is really important people that have a long-term cycles and think in, with a long vision can really be a powerful aid to not feel overwhelmed. So that for me, that was very balancing to not just think about like my next grant or my next job or my next film or my next VR piece, but to start thinking about like the seeds that I'm planting today and what that will look like in 20 years and to see that clearly. Sasha, what, what's, what's hard about working with communities? I, I know that you've really committed um, a, a huge amount of your activist practice, a huge amount of your participatory practice to co-creation. I, I also know because you know we share resources and space that that this isn't always easy. Um, what are the challenges as far as you know either this conflict that I'm sort of trying to draw out between ego and community, or even these conflicts around timeline of wanting to build something and finish it while simultaneously understanding that the more inclusive a process in many ways, uh, the, the more the more time consuming, the more all-encompassing it sort of ends up being. 
Um, yeah, that's such a good question. Um, so I'm going to give just an example from recent work. So I showed this um, this more than code report, and um, I think one of the biggest challenges is the way that, um, for me personally, um, um, so all of us sit within positions of relative uh, privilege and power and also oppression. Um, and so for me personally, so I'm, uh, I have white privilege, um, I am here at MIT at a powerful institution, um, I also experience simultaneously with that um, the form of a, you know, oppression which, is, which comes with cis normativity um, and uh, transphobia and that type of stuff. So, um, so all of us occupy you know, those relative positions, but one of the challenges for me personally has been doing this type of work in the context of an institution that's designed to reward uh, individuals and individual egos and has an entire machinery that's set up to promote um, individuals as sort of sole authors of work, even though all of the work that I do and arguably all of the work that any of us does, right, is, um, is, is collaborative work. But so recently the More Than Code report was you know, featured in a story by MIT News, and so they ran a story about it, and it was, it was a decent story, you know, they interviewed me, I talked about the work, and, um, and then the image that they used, it was like, you know, it was a big photo of me, like my face, and then Sasha Costanza Chad talks about this report. But I'm like, you know, this, this report, and I'm just gonna, you know, read them here so I don't miss anyone, but, you know, this report was produced by the Tech for Social Justice Project that includes Research Action Design, the Open Technology Institute at New America, with our community research partners, Upturn, Media Mobilizing Project from Philly. Shout out for MMP, come on. MMP, anyone? Yeah. Um, coworker.org, Hack the Hood, May 1st People Link. Anyone in here have their website hosted by May 1st? Anyone? No? They're a great activist host. Uh, Palante Technology Cooperative, Volpine Blue, The Engine Room, and so on and so forth. So all these projects have a lot of people, so I'm gonna shout out people as well. But then we have these institutions that are designed, whether it's you know, when we're seeking grant funding for our projects, or you know, our projects get awards, they get recognized, they get into festivals, um, or they get published and talked about in peer-reviewed journals or by these institutions. The structure is set up to do this other type of reward. And so I'm not sure what the solution is, but we have to constantly uh, push back against that and figure out how to lift up the communities that are making this work, um, not only the individuals. Sure, let, so let, let's pursue that for a moment. I mean, there is this sort of fun challenge when we think about co-creation. We, we think about, you know, what does the IMDb entry look like for K Town 92? Does it, you know, I, I, right? And, 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 you know, does it end up essentially featuring and all of Los Angeles, you know, 1992 through the present? You know, do we credit Egypt, um, you know, to, uh, yeah. And, 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 and so, um, but, but looking at that, you know, from a sort of infrastructural perspective, uh, I'm guessing all of us up on the stage believe that moving towards co-creation as sort of a default or maybe more of a default as far as how we create works and bring them out into the world how do we how do we make the world safe for co-creation what are the what are the changes we we need to have happen sasha's just suggested that we need to get better at crediting networks and groups and not getting obsessed with telling the story of the individual which is of course what the university press release always wants to do. We've got this brilliant faculty member, they've done something wonderful in the world, we wanna celebrate their achievements. How do we go and, and what are the other structures that we need to change to, to make the world safe for the, the work that we're trying to do? You wanna try? Uh, I mean, that for me, this is like something I, as a, you know, as someone who's creating work and as you, you said earlier, like some of this work can be considered extraction of, of uh, different communities or I think for people's ability to speak. Grace. Um, I mean, I agree with what everyone said here. It's also about just building, just being really intentional about who's included in the process. So for example, with k 92, you know, I, I'm pretty good at like finding stories, but also, you know, we also um, worked alongside uh, Latino, Latinx filmmakers who also helped find other stories. Um, you know, there's someone who is a member of the mosque who was looking for stories there with us, and you know, it's it's just 
I mean, it's, it's, it's just part of the co-creation process. Um, another thing that sort of, um, something you said earlier about the seven generations, another co-creation that I wanted to mention was, um, it's also building up like who's gonna be making these films and under what kinds of, um, you know, what are the practices that we're sharing with future filmmakers, right? Emerging filmmakers. Um, and one of the co-creation projects that I feel like I've been part of is this creation of this Asian American documentary network, which, um, you know, we, I'm, when I'm thinking 20 years ahead, like who's, you know, I don't wanna have these same conversations about inclusion and diversity in the documentary field or all of this kind of stuff. And so we created, me and a few others, you know, who've been having these conversations, decided to create this network, intentionally like bringing in people that we didn't know of or, and reaching out to people who, um, you know, might not have heard or might not have a have access. So it's, you know, we all have a Slack channel, which we, you know, people can um, join, you know, basically one other person has to introduce you and, you know, everyone has, there's all these channels that we can ask advice or share resources and things like that. So, so, so one of the solutions here is actually sort of generating the community of people yeah. who are sort of building on work that you and many others have done to sort of try to figure out co-creation on this. I'm gonna open this up in just a second, but Sasha, you queued up such a great question. I, I'm hoping you'll take a, a, a crack at it. If we were gonna go after the structures in which we create, and if we're trying to normalize this too weak a world, if, if we're trying to, to promote co-creation um, as becoming an emerging, and eventually I hope maybe dominant form of media making, uh, what are those changes that we need to make beyond, um, you know, how we credit within the within the university? I mean, I, I'm thinking about your the, the universal basic income comments. I mean, I think that a lot of the things are not things that we can deal with within the confines of a particular field. I think a lot of the things that we would need to shift are things that are broader and that are structural. So if we want more, I don't know, if we want more people who are caring for young children to be able to participate in telling their own story, then we need to have like universal, free, good quality childcare, and if we want, and so on and so forth. So I think there's a lot of structural shifts that we need to make, and so to me that implies that media makers and researchers and technologists need to really align ourselves with transformative social movements that are pushing for not only cultural shifts, but also for larger um, policy shifts um, so that we can create the context that will enable us to have a more just and inclusive uh, media space. So we've got some remarkable creators up here. We've started to, I think, scratch the surface of, of some complicated and sometimes very difficult issues. Um, help us out, complicate things a little more. Uh, can, can people um, add into the conversation, ask a question to, to everyone or anyone in particular? Uh, put your hands up and we'll, we'll run some mics back there. Let's go ahead here. Um, thank you everybody for your, your comments and insights. Um, I'm curious to, to just kind of extend the conversation into the sort of spaces in which co-created media is shared and presented. And I was curious in particular in terms of what the sort of challenges and opportunities are of allowing co-created forms of media to enter into more mainstream or otherwise sort of difficult spaces for this type of media to enter into. What are sort of the challenges and opportunities and, and what can be done you know, within the co-creation process to make sure that this, this co-created media reaches all of the spaces that it needs to, maybe even some of the more contested um, mainstream spaces, um, for example. Yeah, Yasmin, where's your HBO deal? <laughs> it's actually, I mean, I don't know if I have a, a complete solution, but, uh, or an answer. Uh, it was, was very, um, during blackout, and we were showing blackout during a time when uh, there's people on the train who are coming out saying their name, and they're undocumented, and there's like, risks, you know, in doing that. And that project is not being distributed because we're, we actually don't know what the home for something like this is. And people are putting themselves on the line. People came out um, to communities about being like uh, very personal, deep, heartfelt things that could get them into trouble with different, you know, uh, whether it's like with the government or uh, in their own communities. Um, and so when, what I was trying to say earlier is exactly this, like the context of where this is shown and how this is distributed and how you treat these subjects, like they're, giving, they're, they're risking a lot. 
Um, and I don't know what the solution is because obviously he was very proud or these, some of these students were very proud and they're making a statement you know, uh, in Trump's America right now to come out and say this, but uh, it's also our, our, like I feel a responsibility. Um, so right now we're, we're mitigating it by trying to find the proper home that, for that specific project, but I don't know how to extend it. I think each project has its own complication and a different context. So I'd love to hear what, how other people are thinking about this. I always like to think about my son, he's 16, and um, I think there's like, they say there's like 1.8 billion gamers worldwide, and at any given moment, you turn on Twitch and there's one million people watching any minute of the day, and I think about my son and his group of other native game designers and LARPers and D&D &D players that they are, and I think that they don't think that they're not mainstream. <laughs> you know, they're like, what do you, what do you mean? Like, my son does not listen to any music that was recorded in a studio, watch any film that was made by a studio. He only watches YouTube and listens to SoundCloud rappers, right? So that he is like, what do you mean mainstream? So I will kind of push back a little bit that the mainstream we think is like, talk to a millennial and think, and ask them if they think what you think is cool is cool, because guess what, it's not. So, I don't know. Um, so I'm gonna push back a little bit and say like the, the world of distributed and decentralized storytelling is here. Um, just ask a teenager, but probably don't because they'll just make fun of you. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted, um, I think that one of another approach to doing that is to like organize our own distribution platforms and um, another shout out, uh, Amar Christian is here uh, in the audience from Open TV in Chicago. So Open TV is doing this incredible um, sort of collaborative production process of uh, uh, narrative series uh, that really center uh, uh, queer and trans, black, uh, and indigenous and POC uh, stories uh, in, in, in Chicago. Um, and they produced uh, Brown Girls, which did get an HBO, uh, it's HBO? Yeah, did get distrib distribution. So it is possible to break into those larger distribution platforms, but also uh, by building uh, our own. Do you want to take a crack at it, or should we take another? Um, I mean, it's just on the internet, so I don't know. I mean, that was the whole goal, is just put it out there. And, and, and also the thing I wanted to say is, you know, another thing I had to kind of throw away was the idea that this is like a final project. I mean, this is just the launch, you know. I think the K-Town 90, 92 is something that's going to evolve. And, you know, we were hurrying for like this anniversary date, so it could come out in April 2017. But since then, we've been doing more interviews, and then feedback comes back, and that's how the subtitles came in. And you know, I think it's just something that's going to continue to grow, and we'll see what happens. I, I wonder if at some point we're going to start thinking about projects like these as having different artifacts that emerge from them. And those artifacts may be something that reach different audiences, but what's really going on is this much larger process. And that process may, in fact, be uh, what our kids are finding that we're not finding yet, because I gotta tell you, with an eight-year-old, I have exactly the same thing. Um, his idea of what constitutes media is, is very, very different from what constitutes media for me. It's what I've been teaching for 20 years, but not actually living, and it's kind of fascinating. Uh, what, other, what other questions can we bring into this, please? <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, in thinking about building frameworks and protocols, I was curious if you guys could talk a little bit more about how you might go about teaching co-creation. Um, so what does that look like in a classroom, if it does? So I, I, I think I, I have to go to Sasha first on this, because a huge number of, of their classes are, are very much about teaching co-creation. But if anyone wants to jump in after that, please please do. Sure, so I teach a collaborative design studio uh, here at MIT. It's usually a mix of undergraduates and graduate students, and then we partner with different community-based organizations, um, often here in Boston, but sometimes they're remote. Um, and I think, um, you know, trying to keep it really, really short, some of the things that I've learned from trying to do that type of pedagogy of, uh, of collaborative design, um, one is to try and find resources to support the community partners to, to fully participate in the process as uh, as co-designers, um, so that means looking for grants, um, whether they're internal to the university or you know, external funding, um, so that um, community organizers can really be in the class the entire time, not just, uh, and, and help shape uh, everything about the projects, not only a place to check in with occasionally. And I haven't always been able to do that, but it definitely works better when that happens. 
Also, um, some of the things that we need to teach the students, um, in addition to, um, you know, deprogram deprogramming their minds so that they don't necessarily think that they're just like this genius that's going to solve the thing for the community, um, but really value the different types of experience uh, and lived experience that people are bringing to the table. There's some really basic stuff that I'm always surprised that people haven't learned in other classes, like at the beginning of the project they have to write up and basically sign a contract together about who's doing what work and who's going to own the thing on the other side and who's going to get credit for it and those things seem really um, simple and basic but i think they're really important um, to teach yeah um so there's a whole um initiative that uh, was happening on the back you know the underbelly of, of 18 days in egypt which is a kind of classroom or an educational program where um, to do this work, it wasn't like realistic to just kind of come into a city and this is going to magically happen and you're going to nurture and grow in, with the community. What happened was actually we built an educational program that was backed by Kickstarters um, uh, where uh, we called it like an, a citizen journalism training program and we would bring in experts and we'd work with these, pe uh, these uh, young citizen journalists essentially for weeks on time about what does it mean to do this type of co-creative work um, and this cycle happened over a few times and it even became its own journalism program that was backed by uh, USAID uh, at, at, uh, the following year. Um, and it actually became, and then until things got, became too political and we had to stop the initiative, but um, part of even m making a project like this was teaching the evangelists and the ambassadors of the project what does it even mean to co-create. <laughs> I want to add one quick thing. If you have the privilege to teach students in higher education, I would please urge you to expand your definition of the classroom and to collaborate with public libraries, with other nonprofits, with ed tech corporations, with community colleges, um, because we, you know we have that problem where we're working in silos, and I think something really transformative can happen when you live this life of co-creation and you model it with the structure of the way your class is taught. Thank you. Um. It sounds like we should probably wrap up at this point, um, which I hate to do because I have about 17 more questions I want to ask. Um, but if we could just pause and, and thank everyone for taking part and for the I'd like to take a moment just to extend this panel a little bit. Um, so I have a question for all of you. Uh, this has been a very, very, um, informative panel. What is something that you haven't said? What is an uncomfortable <coughs> thing that you've been too polite to say this afternoon? <laughs> there are people who are not here. There are people who are missing from this conversation and we should just all take a moment to think about who those people are, uh, what demographics, from what locations, from what backgrounds, different languages that are spoken. There are people who are missing here and I wish and I hope they're here next time. Thank you for offering that. That's, thank you very much. That's a key question I ask in my practice. Who's not here? So, so who's not here? Let's name them. Let's talk about it. Our ancestors are here with us. <laughs> who's not here? Um, my son isn't here with me. <laughs> I hope he sees me in the, in the streaming. <laughs> Anyone else who's not here? Uh, I don't know. Returning citizens. Returning, yeah, returning citizens. Right. There's no babies in the room. <laughs> How many single mothers are here? Just a couple single mothers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are not a lot of people with, uh, you know, uh, different uh, ways of moving around the world here. Mm -hmm. Right? I think, yeah. I think we're an uh, overwhelmingly privileged audience. Yes. Absolutely. Acknowledge that. Let's, yeah. Whatever affinity you may have. Uh, and, and, and that's a huge percentage of people not here. Right. Yeah, right. So I'm going to ask the, uh, not the audience, the rest of you, because we're a group here. What else have we not said? What are we being too polite to say? Because for a panel that is supposed to be addressing risk and dangers, this was the safest risk and danger conversation um, I've ever heard in my entire life. Perhaps it's because I'm from the hood, but let's have some real talk. What are we not talking about? We're not talking about the role and impact that the 
gatekeepers have on our creative process, whether it be ego-driven or co-creative driven, and those gatekeepers are, of course, the funders, and whether or not, um, and it could be broadcasters, festival directors, etc. but that's a role that is very true in our community, that the only way we are able to, those of us who require funding to do our work, we ultimately have to say certain things, write certain things, convince the gatekeepers that this is bound. And so there's a, talk about privilege, there's an even greater elite who ultimately shape what is shaped. So we've not talked about that. And of course, at the risk of, and I'm always that person of biting the hand that feeds us, uh, because that's how we've got to be here. But it's just, you know, I think it's an important uh, conversation about who gets to decide even who gets to create. Mm -hmm. gets to co mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And I know that there's a panel tomorrow um, where uh, the funders will do some self-interrogation as well and explore that question. So thank you for raising it. What else haven't we seen? Um, what I was kind of hoping to hear more about was uh, visitor protocol and how um, non-indigenous people interact on the land with the people that are supposed to be on the land. Like, um, I'm not. Uh, I, I was hoping to see more representation of that here too as well. Okay, all right. Thank you for that. I'll, I'll take one more. Well, I see two. So, uh, if you've spoken already, sir. Okay, one short, short. Yes. And then I, I see you. I'm just saying that the, the notion of, uh, of co-creation is, is not foreign. Uh, for filmmakers of, of color, if you don't co-create, you don't create. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's part of resistance, and it's, it's part of um, dealing with majority viewpoint, majority gaze. And so, if you, and so I, I just wanted to start there. Okay. Thank you, sir. And so one, one, there's one more comment right back there. Um, then I'm going to share a couple of questions. Uh, thanks for squeezing me in. Uh, we didn't talk much about the economy of co-creation and the actual material benefits to the communities that we engage in co-creative processes. Okay. And to me and my work, that's something that I'm constantly struggling with. Okay, thanks for raising that. So that is a good, okay, sure, slip it in, slip it in. No, <laughs> yes. I just, I, I don't think we talk enough about what to create. Like everyone, I don't know, like, do not do we not bring in all our pre-notions, our pre-experiences and ideas of what to fix? Like, do people show up with no idea ever? Mm -hmm. You know, shouldn't we be listening to those banging on our door rather than deciding what to create and then engaging them? Right. Thank you for that as well. Very important, I'm gonna throw some questions out here. And uh, some of them will be uncomfortable because we're not doing our job if they're not. Um, so who gets paid and funded? Um, so co-creation uh, is steeped in many indigenous practices across the world, right? So are we uh, regurgitating or repeating something back to folks? Um, and some people actually do need authorship and credit because there's been histories where people have had that erased. How do we, um, so, so, so also, is this a tactic for dominant culture uh, media makers to continue to call ideas of historically oppressed communities who become increasingly media savvy? Um, how does race and class fit into this? Um, which partners are more valued than other partners? Um, because even within groups of people working toward a shared goal, there are hierarchies. Even within historically marginalized communities, there are hi hierarchies. We haven't talked about hierarchies here today at all. Um, where are safer spaces to talk about errors that have been made in this work and hurts that have been um, done to communities? We didn't talk about that today at all, and I'm sure everyone here has made some errors. Um, how do we ensure that we don't replicate power imbalances within groups of co-creators? Mm -hmm. We all, how do we unlearn? And how do we name our implicit uh, biases that we bring to this work? 
how do we ultimately self-interrogate? So I noticed that a lot of the conversation has been about sort of people who are co-creating and then sort of mainstream media makers. Um, and that's like a really easy sort of conversation to have, but how do we turn the conversation inward and self-interrogate in ways that are courageous and extraordinarily productive? Just a few questions. <laughs> <laughs> Would the panel would the panel like to take just a moment uh, to answer any of those questions or just share thoughts? Um, I definitely never thought when I was a very young single mother that I would be able to be on this stage with each and every one of you. And I think all of the people who've done work for many, many, many years to make it possible for me to do this. And I hope that when I am old that I will have done the work for someone like me. Um, but I hope that it's not as hard. I hope it doesn't come to a, a small amount of people. Um, I constantly interrogate the way in which I work to make sure that I'm pulling through not one more of me, but 10,000 of me. And I think I want to see a change in my lifetime. So. Um, that's part of what my practice is, and I, in order to do that, I have to work with people who have such different skills than I have, um, and so much more knowledge, because if I wait to learn it, um, and do it as well as someone who's done it for 80 years, then I will never do it in my lifetime, so I think I have to, um, we have to be like, you know, this neural net of people, and I have to source the information, and just become help to others, so. No, it's a very vague statement, but thank you for those questions. They're amazing. Okay. All right. I might just leave it there because I do think it may, might take some time to really think through some of those those questions. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave those I'm going to leave those questions there for now. I'm going to thank you very much again for what you've shared this afternoon. Thank you very much.